Oscar weekend is upon us, and with that we celebrate another year of pushing filmmaking to its limits by watching the Hollywood elite cheer and congratulate each other for yet another entire evening. But more specifically, like the well-rounded, multifaceted enjoyers of media that we all are, we like to focus on the nominees of the most important category of the show, Best Visual Effects. As some of you might know, every year studios submit breakdown reels of their best work in their films to the Academy in hopes of making the shortlist of 10 qualified potential nominees, where they participate in the January Bake Offs, presenting their work to Academy members. Then, votes are cast to ultimately decide on the final five films officially nominated for the Oscars. In preparation of your Oscar night party, whether you and your friends get dressed up in designer brands and roll out the red carpet to your living room, role playing as celebrity fashion critics, or you watch that shit alone, we'll break down what you need to know about each of the five nominations so that you can either cheer or yell angrily at your TV like Britney off her meds when it gets robbed of the award you know it deserves. And this year, the nominees are The Creator. In the midst of a fierce conflict between humanity and artificial intelligence, Joshua, a former Special Forces operative, is enlisted to track down and eliminate The Creator, the enigmatic mastermind behind sophisticated AI technology. The Creator possesses a secretive weapon capable of terminating both the war and humanity itself. Delving into enemy-controlled zones with his elite squad, Joshua uncovers that the apocalyptic weapon is, in fact, an AI embodied in the guise of a young child. What a twist. The visual effects were provided mainly by ILS and quite a few others, but we all know how credits work in this business. Fun fact, the director of this film, Gareth Edwards, got his start as a visual effects artist before going on to direct the 2014 Godzilla reboot and Star Wars Rogue One. What's unique about this film is just that, the fact that Edwards himself is a visual effects artist and thus approached the film's effects from that point of view. His team managed to create what should have been a $200 million effects movie on an $80 million budget. It still sounds like a lot, and it is, but still a significant achievement, and they were able to do that by clever planning and the tried and true production technique that never failed known as cutting corners. Many of the shots, particularly some b-roll style footage, was filmed just capturing locals in Vietnam in their own environment. In many cases, they didn't even bother with tracking markers or green screens or lidar scans because they wanted the ability to pick on the fly who in a shot they would convert into an android and who would remain human. Studios are like, thanks a heap, Gareth. The precedence you set of not gathering any onset data is sure to make you a lot of friends in the prep departments. Huge shout out to all the roto and tracking artists on this one. You guys are the unsung heroes of this entire project. You all deserve a long vacation in an all-inclusive paid for by the good folks at Disney. Beautiful location photography digitally enhanced by CGI and matte paintings, lots of Android digi double replacements, and some massive scale natural effects, all to add texture to a fantastical yet somehow completely tangible world. Godzilla minus one. Japan, still reeling from the aftermath of the Second World War, faces a colossal threat emerging near Tokyo's shores. Koichi, a traumatized deserter haunted by his initial encounter with Godzilla, views this as a chance to atone for his actions during the war. The film's VFX was led by a team of 35 artists under the supervision of the movie's director, Takashi Yamazaki, a total of 610 VFX shots over the course of eight months. This is another instance where the film's director is also himself a VFX artist. He even mentioned going into ZBrush himself and mocking up the character design of Godzilla before passing it on to another artist to take over, because artists love receiving half-baked concept models from their director. Apparently he was even stepping into some shot layout and smoke effects. These practices were echoed across the entire staff, where they often cut out the middlemen and had many talented generalists fill multiple roles, as opposed to the productions that I'm used to, where I'll get feedback from five supervisors, two leads, and the intern, all before the director finally steps in a month later and decides to roll back to version one because... You know, some of the CGI is shit in this movie. Um... The director himself even acted as the VFX supervisor, which is completely unheard of in any Hollywood production. We're seeing more and more of these VFX artist directors rather than your typical actor directors stepping up and directing full features, and I'm absolutely here for it. The results speak for themselves when it comes to the film's VFX. What they're able to achieve on the budgets they're able to achieve it on is completely unmatched. What's really mind-boggling about this movie's VFX is the scope of the VFX managed by such a small team. We're not talking about a handful of artists handling some bargain bin TikTok filter style effects. We're talking high fidelity creature animation, integration, large set extensions, crowd work, destruction sims, and fluid simulations at a massive scale, which is by far some of the most complex stuff to deal with when it comes to CG. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. After the devastating loss of Gamora, Peter Quill must unite his team to safeguard the universe and ensure the safety of one of their own. Failure in the mission could spell out the demise of the Guardians as we know them. This one is more along the lines of your run-of-the-mill classic tentpole blockbuster VFX that took a village of top 10 VFX houses to bring James Gunn's vision to life over the course of 15 months. It 
it was a massive collaboration, notably between Weta Effects and Framestore, on over 3,000 shots, with likely thousands of artists across the world. It's got all the typical high-end effects that we've come to expect out of Marvel and Guardians movies at this point. Massive sci-fi environments, hyper-realistic creature work, and wild effect simulations and space battles scattered throughout the entire movie's runtime. It even featured an entire planet made of raw meat. Sorry, I meant to add a vegan trigger warning there. But above all, what's really, really impressive about this one is without a doubt, the ping in Rocket's eye. I mean, don't get me wrong, the creature work is insane. I fully believe Rocket is real, the anim is incredible, his fur looks super realistic, and their usage of onset reference to match the CG2 obviously paid off hugely. But really though, that ping, man. Good luck to the Guardians VFX team. We are grouting for you. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 In the latest Mission Impossible installment, Ethan Hunt and his IMF team are tasked with locating a dangerous new weapon capable of catastrophic harm should it be seized by the wrong parties. As the future and destiny of the world hang in the balance, a high-stakes global pursuit ensues. Encountering an enigmatic and formidable adversary, Ethan is compelled to prioritize the mission above all else, even of the lives of his closest allies. The American James Bond is back at it again with explosions, wild stunts, new lady spy supporting characters, and crazy twist face reveals. Impossible mission made possible only through the sheer courage and willpower of the world's greatest secret agent, Tom Cruise, and his side chick, I mean kick, Agent Carter. Once again, lots of top VFX talent collaborating on over 2,000 shots here, but the real story behind the VFX here is the invisible effects. The entire movie is littered with complex CG shots, but you might watch the entire movie and not be able to tell that there are any at all. That's the biggest trick that Mission Impossible pulls off. The effects are so grounded since many of their stunts were actually shot practically and only later enhanced using CGI, whereas you might be able to tell that Cyborg's Godzilla and sci-fi meat planets might not have been captured in camera, who knows, Godzilla might have been double booked that day. It's not always obvious that the sandstorm in Abu Dhabi isn't real, that massive crowd extensions were added in post, that entire luggage facility was massively extended in 3D, cars were replaced during action chases, traffic was added in, entire environments were built out of CGI, and even some bystanding crowd was added in after the fact. Even the train fighting action sequence was shot practically, but then hugely enhanced with more set extensions and pyro simulations. The bulk of the work is fairly standard CG stuff, but there's a ton of it, but they did an exceptional job of making use of practical effects and blending it in with full CG work completely seamlessly. Napoleon. The narrative delves into the beginnings of the military commander turned emperor, chronicling his rapid and merciless ascent to power, all while examining the complex and often tumultuous bond he shares with his wife and ultimate confidant, Josephine. This one took 12 VFX studios covering a thousand shots to assemble everything together. This was another case of invisible effects, despite this interview that kind of leads us to believe that it was all shot practically. <laughs> What we're looking at here is not CGI. No, it's all real. Fashion. Yes. Ridley didn't shoot thousands of actors in camera and then hire 12 VFX houses to hold the camera for him. Ocean sims and hundreds of boats were added in post, as well as thousands of crowd actors during battle sequences, massive set extensions, and beautiful effect simulations. They really did an incredible job shooting very clever plates for future VFX work and adding practical lights when needed to seamlessly blend the CGI into the live action. In many cases, they did make a concerted effort to shoot as much practically as possible and keep as much of it as they can, but inevitably when doing this kind of work, much of it ends up being replaced digitally. My best guess is that the creator takes it. Since tentpole Marvel superhero movies tend to be fighting an uphill battle, since the audience has become accustomed to expecting that kind of quality from them, the creator, however, has the power of an interesting story behind it. And I'm not talking about the tale of an AI takeover, but rather that of a VFX artist director reimagining how filmmakers go about shooting for VFX on a much tighter budget and seamlessly create obviously impossible visuals that feel eerily real. They've managed to create an entire fictional world that feels like it could absolutely exist as an extrapolation of our present day. Not unlike what Neil Blomkamp was able to achieve with District 9. That being said, I have a sweet spot for the underdogs here, and I'm low-key hoping Godzilla minus one to win. It's really crazy to think about what they were able to achieve with such a small team on such a small budget. The effects are massive in scale, and the cinematography is top. And there you have it, a little summary of this year's visual effects shortlist. Let us know your predictions for this year in the comment. Like, share, subscribe if you haven't already, and join the fun. Hopefully this year they don't cut off the winner's speed.